Center under the National Kitchen and Bath Association. And I'm here this evening to talk to you about uh, kitchen and bath remodeling for aging in place. So basically, aging in place is not just for senior citizens. It runs the whole gamut of people from young babies all the way up to hospice. The idea is that you're wanting to stay in your home as long as you can and make your home as safe as possible for yourself and all the people who live there and all the people who visit you there. Um, I'm going to uh, divide the program into two sections. So the first part is going to focus on bathrooms and the second part will focus on kitchens. So basically I like to talk about that a, a good bathroom is a smart bathroom because really what it boils down to is common sense. There's, there's no real big technology involved in this other than safety and making an environment that people are going to be safe in. Um, some of the things involved in a smart bathroom are ample circulation, good, good, good lighting, smart organization so that people can find things, convenience, enjoyment, therapeutic benefits, and proper design. Um, ideally, a single-story home would be a great start, but for those of us who don't have a single-story home, if you have a two-story home, multiple-story home, if you can try and provide a bathroom on the main floor so that if anyone gets disabled, anyone gets injured, they have to stay on one level, you've got it covered on the ground floor until they rehabilitate. I'm going to uh, talk in a few different sections here. The first place, the, uh, the first aspect would be the shower. The idea in a shower is to make it a safe washing place. So typically what you want is wide entry doors and possibility of having no doors, no doors at all, but there will be space and size restrictions for this, whether you do a walk-in shower or you have a shower that is big enough for a turn, turning radius for a wheelchair, which is actually five feet of clearance in the center of the, of the room. You want to have easy access shower controls, so basically what you want to do is be able to control the water, the hot and cold, and feel the temperature prior to stepping into the shower. That could be something as simple as something you reach from the outside in, or something like, say, if you have a handheld shower on a hose, you're in there already, you're aiming the water away from you, and you can check the temperature before you actually put it on your body. Um, I do have some things here that I did, did make, uh, these collages, which I encourage you to come up and take a look at closer. I can point to them as I explain some of these things. Some of the detail may be a little hard to see from, from far, but um, there's a lot of good examples here of universal design in bathrooms and kitchens. Um, some of the ideas would be a bench or a folding seat. We have some in the uh, display inside here. Uh, flip down benches. Um, I'm going to put this down for a minute. There are a lot of really good products on the market right now, basically. This is like a handheld shower spray in the shower so that if you have a weak grip, um, it has a strap on the back to hold it on your hand here. The other thing about it is its shape. I don't know if you can see there's a curve in the shape. But ergonomically, this design of this shower head is better to one that has a straight head because when you're putting the water on your body, you don't have an awkward strain on your shoulder and your elbow by having to do this. It's actually meant to ergonomically work around your body. Um, another thing in bathrooms basically is your uh, faucet. And again, this is a really good design of a faucet. It's got what they call a loop handle. So if you had any grasping problems, if you had arthritis, or even if you just had soapy hands, stick your finger in there and you've got total control of the faucet, hot, cold, on and off. And these are really easy to clean because there's only one post here. So there's a lot of advantages that way as well. Um, when you talk about grab bars, that's another thing that comes up in showers. Basically, they come in every different finish you can imagine now. Oil rub bronze, brushed nickel, polished uh, brass, whatever. This is a little bit of an example of them. This is the kind most of us are familiar with. They're making them much more delicate, much more uh, low profile than they used to be in the different finishes. However, these here tend to be a little slippery on the back. And uh, you have choices now that actually have rubber inserts on the back here, so you have a feeling of a much more secure and a much more safe grip behind it. 
There's something for pretty much every occasion here. So say, for example, this would be an angled one. This is actually a really good one for a shower or next to a toilet. So say, for example, this was on the wall here. You needed to pull yourself forward. You could push yourself up with this one here and gain your stability that way. Also, because of its length, you're not trying to grab a really small piece of metal. You've got quite a bit of sturdiness here. And by the way, the, the proper grab bars are rated for 300 to 500 pound weight. So it's not just a glorified towel bar. And you don't want to grab one of those if you're falling anyway, because it'll fall with you. Um, this is kind of an ingenious invention here. This is a combination grab bar and toilet tissue holder. So if you've got that next to the toilet here as well, you can help yourself up, push yourself up. The other thing about it is the ease of being able to put a roll on there with one hand. So it's not like the ones that are spring-loaded that you have to use two hands to get a roll on and off. So everything is geared to make your life a little bit easier and a little less challenging as we age. This guy here is a combination grab bar and towel bar. So kind of a multi-purpose type of thing. In fact, I see this as a really good useful thing in a shower where you can use it for stability and then when you're done taking a shower, you can actually hang your towel or your washcloth on here. And again, these things are really designed to just blend with all your other fixtures. So say if you get brushed chrome in this, a brushed chrome faucet, brushed chrome uh, tissue holder in that, it's really just a coordinated bunch of uh, uh, hardware in your, in your bathroom. Another key important factor in safe showers is a non-skid bottom. What I have here basically is a material that, um, it's a solid surface material that's reinforced with fiberglass. It has a pebbled bottom, so it's non-skid. This is a preformed shower floor. All the interior corners are rounded, so it makes it really easy to clean. The color goes all the way through it, so that if you drop something on it, it's not going to chip. It's really, really sturdy and self-supporting, so it's not going to flex like, flex, like um, um, uh, fiberglass, which can feel kind of you know, soft under your feet. And again, it's going to give you that feeling of safety. And this one here, you can do anything you want up the walls. You can put your decorative tile or porcelain or whatever you want, but at least you've got a safe base. Also very easy to clean, which is nice. <laughs> Um, soap and shampoo niches, if you can, have them recessed into the wall so that they're not protruding into your space where you can bump into them and you're going to have bruising without even knowing it. Just turning around, you can bruise yourself in a shower. So plan for having a niche in there to hold your, your soap and your shampoo. There are specialized types of val valves. I believe everyone probably by code now has to have a pressure balanced valve and that means if you're taking a shower in the bathroom, and someone down at the other end of the house is putting in a load of laundry, when they turn on the water, you're not going to get scalded. It's, it's equalizing the pressure in the whole house. There is another type of valve called a temperature control valve, and that's an actual anti-scald function. There's two ways that you can work with that. One, you can set the maximum temperature that the water will be, so it'll never get above a certain temperature, so people are not going to wash their hands and the last person had it on extra hot. The other thing is, is there are temperature controlled valves that you can set at a comfortable temperature for you, which typically is going to be around 100 degrees, so that the water coming out is 100 degrees. You don't have to wait for the mixer or gas or scald yourself and freeze yourself and go through one of those. So again, if you're remodeling or you're building a new home, think about these things. I mean, you're going to put a valve in the wall anyway, so now's the time to start thinking about some things that are going to make it safer for you as time goes by. Um, needless to say, in conjunction with this, you need some, some type of non-skid flooring uh, tile. If you're going to go with tile, it should be small, like say 2x2, two 3x3 two, three three with a textured finish. That's going to stop you from slipping as much, as well as the grout lines. The idea of having more frequent grout lines, that's part of the non-slip uh, feature of having it like that. You can't just have a big solid surface or you're going to end up on your behind. Um, bathtubs are kind of another challenge. Uh, a lot of people are replacing bathtubs with showers, which is a good idea as well, but there's nothing like a hot bath. So if you are putting in a bathtub, a really good idea is to drop a bathtub in a framed surround so that you have a deck around the tub. And if possible, if you can make it a contrasting color to really define the seating area. 
So as we get older and our visual acuity diminishes, it's easier to tell what's the end of the deck and where's the tub because the idea is that you're going to sit on the edge and swing your, free, your feet over. Later on you may need help to do this, but at least you've got a safe place to sit down and dry your feet. You've got a place to set your goodies around there so you're not reaching over things. Um, it's also a good idea to have your accessible faucet and water control toward the end where you're going to turn it on so you're not reaching over a tub to try and feel what temperature the water is coming out of the spout. Um, towel bars should also be well placed there so that you have a towel ready so that you're not tempted to stand in the tub and try and reach out and grab a towel that's just six inches a little too far away. Well, there are also, and you'll see one on here, this is a really good example for anybody who wants to come up here and check this out. There's a, these walk-in bathtubs, which you probably would have seen advertised on TV. They're actually very, very good. Here's an example here of one that's built in in a really beautiful, luxurious retreat type uh, situation in a bathroom, because you can go in there, shut the door, sit down, recline. It has jets. It's got a handheld shower massager, it's got a sprayer, you can shampoo your hair, and it's safe. It has a very low threshold, so you're stepping over that, and that's, that's a way to have a real safe bath. Vanities and dressing tables are kind of another challenge here. Um, thinking about that they need to be an appropriate height to fit the user, which again is a real common sense thing. It seems over time people have gotten a little bit taller and a little bit more aware of things like back pain, uh, all those wonderful ailments we get. But the standard vanity height over the years, I've been in this industry many, many years, and I've seen the standard vanity height go from 30 inches out now up to about 34 and a half, which is the finished height that it is in a kitchen. The whole idea being is that when you're bending over, you're not straining your low back as much. And once you use a vanity that's a, a taller height, and then you go to one that's lower, boy, it feels like you're dropping to your knees almost. But basically, the idea is that you're bending over, you're not straining your low back, you can wash your face and, and you know, brush your teeth and do what you're doing there without back strain. At a vanity also, there's several choices in your mirrors, and lighting is important in this too. Like what you want to be able to do is assure that you're going to see in the mirror whether you're in a standing or a seated position. So try and bring the mirror as far down as you can to the top of the backsplash or down to the countertop. There's also a choice of having a mirror on a pivot so that you can aim it down and aim it up as you're using it or maybe a small child's going to use it or a very tall person. At that point too, it's not a bad idea to have sconces on either side of the mirror because what you want is you want the lighting to illuminate where your face is. I mean, it's nice to have one above there, but your face isn't really up there. So trying to illuminate the area so, again, you're not straining. You can also remove doors and panels of cabinetry for seated access. So, I mean, there are, from the front, it looks like a regular cabinet, a cabinet, but you can open the doors, remove the doors. There's also mobile cabinets, mobile vanity cabinets on casters. There's an example of one over here. This is actually a kitchen version here. But basically, you can pull it out from under the countertop You've got a top there that you can set your things on. You can move it across the bathroom if you're moving things. But also, it's your storage. So at one point, you may only need a little space for your little dressing table, your little chair. Later on, if you need a wheelchair there, you can use the same, same space in the same bathroom. Um, anytime that you have exposed pipes, like if you're doing a, a sink with exposed pipes underneath, you really need to wrap those pipes and insulate them so you're not burning anybody's legs with hot water. I mean, you can always cover those pipes with like an angled panel like that so that it's not really obvious, and then that's removable if you need maintenance, but uh, you just don't want to have any scalding issues there. Faucets are, I mentioned also the faucets like this, and it's, it's kind of hard to tell on this one, but they're also for visual acuity as well. Their red is hot and blue is cold, so you can get faucets that have bigger dots so that, you know, if you're not sure which is hot and which is cold, because some people have trouble figuring out a single lever faucet, so it's there for you too if you want to, you know, pay attention to that there. I want to say a little bit about countertops. Um, 
I myself have really bad depth perception and I can't find things on pattern tops, so granite is a killer for me, but uh, there are a lot of countertops that have a more consistent pattern to them or a lighter pattern. This particular material is a quartz material, which has the color that goes all the way through it. You can find things on it. You can get various colors like this, but um, basically you never have to seal it, so it's low maintenance. It's really easy to clean. It doesn't stain, and it doesn't, it's more forgiving when it comes to scratches and things like that. And again, trying to make your life easier now and as time goes by because nobody wants to clean the house more or harder than they have to. So that's, that's a good consideration when you're looking at countertops. I know uh, tile countertops were in vogue for a long period of time, but most people are trying to get away from the grout joints and things like that, so we really don't see a whole lot of that anymore. Um, cultured marble was very, very popular back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's still available now. The problem with cultured marble is scratching, so it's uh, poured in a mold and it's actually got a very thin film on it, so it's by nature of that 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 film is wearing off and it will show a lot of scratches. So it will look very beat up very soon. So think about that. Um, the other thing is, is these are like hypoallergenic and, and antimicrobial. Like say for example, this quartz has a good housekeeping seal of approval. It's got a lifetime warranty. So those are things you aren't gonna have to worry about replacing. So it's done, your investment is over. Toilets, you've probably, depending on the age of the home that you have, like the conversion went from three gallons to one and a half or 1.6 gallon flushes. There are a lot of toilets now that are basically chair height or comfort height. So they're taller than what you're used to. So when you're renovating or remodeling, you, you very likely will have one of the older toilets in there. You cannot put it back in. That's the code. You cannot put a three gallon flush toilet back in when you take it out. So. I encourage you to go to a showroom, sit on a toilet, you know, I mean, see the difference because what happens later on if you don't do this is you're going to want to put one of those foam booster chairs on there, which, which does work. I helped my dad with his when, when he was, you know, in our care. But again, if you're planning to stay there, you're, you're going to buy a toilet, buy one that's going to work for you over the long run. So um, if you have an opportunity to put a toilet that has space next to it, like try and avoid putting a toilet between, say, a bath and a shower and a, and a uh, vanity if you can. If there's any way to arrange like a side access to a toilet so that someone can transfer it on the side or if they have a mobility device with them that they need to access that way, have a little space there. You know, see if you can make the plan so that it works for like a better plan uh, to begin with. Lighting is also very important. There's a couple of different kinds of lighting. Um, ambient lighting is lighting generally as you walk through the room. It's usually your ceiling lighting that you flip on when you walk in. And then the task lighting is the lighting at your vanity so that you know, you're gonna illuminate the place that you wanna focus on. There's water resistant lights that you can put on the ceiling in the shower. That's a really good idea. A lot of people don't put lights in the shower, but hey, you know, <laughs> You're getting older, if your visual acuity is bad, they have waterproof lights for that. They're flat, they, they, they just kind of have a flat lens and they kind of disappear in the ceiling. So you'll, you'll be glad you had that. Um, if you're doing switches, new switches being replaced, use the rocker style switch, the ones that you just touch that go you know, on and off rather than switching like a lever like this, makes it a little, a little bit easier and make them at an accessible level. There's my helper here. <laughs> You're just in time. Yeah, thank you. We All forgot right. part. We forgot a part. Okay. Other than that, there's you know there's quite a bit you can do. I mean, these are just kind of some basic things. Like when we sit down with you and we're trying to design a space and help you make this decision that you're going to stay in this home. I want to pass this home on to my children. My mom and dad are still alive. We're all going to be in this together. We will sit down with you and talk about anything that you want as far as what's going to work for you best because it's a totally individual thing. Everything from bathing the grandkids and the dog all the way up to people who want to have hospice in their home at the very end. And I've seen all ends of that and comfort of staying in your own home, there's nothing like that. There's nothing, nothing better than that. Um, I'm going to touch on, I'm going to do kitchens next, but one thing I wanted to point out, we were talking, this is going to apply to both rooms. 
one of the things you're going to be choosing, like when you have cabinetry in a vanity or cabinetry in a kitchen, cabinets there, you're going to need pulls. So this board here is kind of set up where there are similar pulls, but there are better and worse choices when you come to pulls. This one here, say for example, this side of the board is better than this side. And the standpoint is like, say, this one here, you want to make sure that it's big enough for every size hand that's going to be in there. So I know my grandfather could probably barely get his hand in this one here, but again, it's got an arch to it, if you can see that. One of the other important things about pulls is that they return to the face of the cabinet. This type here that extend beyond, this type here, they catch on things. People rip their shorts pockets, they rip their apron pockets, their clothes catch on it when you're going by. These are not a very good idea. They look really pretty, but there are better choices that are equally as nice. If you like a country look and you like kind of a cup hinge, there are some that are very flared that give you a lot of room to put your hands underneath, or there are some that are very flat and very small. So, you know, again, try them on, <laughs> try them on. They're like a pair of shoes, you know, they got to fit for all the people that are going to use them. Knobs and pulls, if you choose to do a knob or a pull, I like to put knobs on wall cabinets and pulls on low cabinets, just because I know they're not going to grab your clothes on the way by if they're up there. But again, these are very similar pulls. This one here is taller, similar to this one, which is very squat. So, you know, getting your fingers under here and grasping that is harder than this one. And also this one here, this one has a little rosette that raises it up a little bit further so it's easier to grab. This one is so tiny. I mean, if it's for like maybe a little girl's bedroom or something like that, I mean, it, it's, it's really, really hard to to do that. So anyway, again, it, it's all about choices. And as you're making the choices for all the things that are going to go into your home, try them on and, you know, think about how you're going to use them. Now kitchens, now that's my world. <laughs> um, smart kitchens, basically what you want to find in a, in a smart kitchen, <clears throat> of course, safety, which is a number one priority, versatility, Comfort, it needs to be well-equipped, convenient, and efficient. Um, the National Kitchen and Bath Association does have a planning guideline book that we use when we're laying things out. There's a whole set of design guidelines just in general, and in conjunction with that, there's also an access guideline. So we know how much room it's going to take for you to reach over a counter. We know how high you're going to be able to reach if you're going to switch a light on and off. All of those things will be incorporated in the design as well. So uh, it's, it's a very uh, real thing to be able to do it. And again, measure for the people who are going to use the space. It's simple as that. And everybody's a different size and shape and height and <laughs> capacity. Um, generally, the feeling is that the best shapes for kitchens, if you can simplify the design, would be a U shape or an L shape. Islands are nice too, but islands require a bigger room again. Okay, I mean, although it's nice to be able to move around a central island, you still are going to have a minimum walkway and minimum all the way around it, whereas like a U-shape or a U-shape or an L-shape is going to give you a nice turning radius in the middle. I know people that will put a mobile island on casters in the middle, like a butcher block or something like that, and then later on take it away. It doesn't have to be permanent, but, but you would have that extra storage space and extra prep space during, during the interim. Um, years ago, and probably still now, there's, there was a lot of accent on the work triangle in the kitchen, and that typically would be the distance between your sink, your, your range, and your refrigerator. Okay, so that's an ideal situation there. What that has gone away from now is basically looking at workstations. So you have a storage area. Your storage area would be like your pantry and your refrigerator for hot and cold foods. You would have a prep area where you're doing your chopping and, and you're, you're prepping your food and your spices and things like that. You have a cook, cooking areas, which would be your stove or your ovens. And then you would also have a cleanup area, which is your sink and your dishwasher. So, you know, again, these are, are like areas where you're moving around the room and you want them to be as convenient as possible. So the distances between them don't become as critical as a triangle. So as long as it has all the goodies you need where you're doing what you're doing in there. Um, 
Also in a kitchen, it's really a good idea if you can have a seating space, at least even one space where somebody can sit and relax. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you've been at work all day and you want to chop some vegetables, but you don't feel like doing it standing up. So give yourself a break. Have a place to sit down on a stool and chop. Maybe your grandson is going to visit and he wants to do his homework and visit with you while you're cooking. There's a space for that in there as well. And from a social point of view, if you have a guest coming over and a visitor and they want to sit and have a cup of coffee, they don't have to go across at the table in the dining room or whatever. There is a space in there that's very, very functional. Um, countertops, again, countertops are very doable. I've got a whole kitchen. All the kitchens in the universal design uh, collage over here are universal design kitchens. They're all really beautiful, and you really have to study them closely to see what the subtle differences are, and it isn't really the planning of the spaces, the separation of spaces, the ease of getting to everything in there, working your way around. Um, one of the things that's most important is to try and keep some rounded spaces in there rather than pointed spaces. So again, a bullnose edge is a little more friendly than a square edge. Your corners here, instead of being square, do a radius corner so that as you're coming around, you're not going to bump yourself and bruise yourself. This is a counterpart of a lever handle faucet for a kitchen. So again, you've got the loop handle here. Uh, many of these will have a pull-out spray here or a separate sprayer here if you want to pull out. But again, the control is simple. One finger here, like this. And this is, this is a very reasonably priced product. These are all Moens, by the way. This is a Growy product, but all of these are from a, a home care catalog. So they work. They work. If you're having like a table, let's see, like a peninsula table or something like this, like a little keyhole kind of table, you can work this in the design so that you don't have to have a separate furniture setting where you have a table and chairs. This is a great place to just sit and do and you do your bills. You can do your cooking there. You can have your coffee, read the paper. But again, it's part of the space. That's a really good idea here. This one here, there's just a little bar drop down to regular table level here. This is actually a pull-out table. So if you want to get it out of the way, you can slide it underneath the microwave. This is just a pull-out table top for access here. So it's all very doable. Okay, appliances. You'll also have the challenge of choosing appliances if you're remodeling or building a home. And if you haven't looked at appliances in a long time, <laughs> the technology can get very, very scary. The best advice I can give you is make sure you look at the features and choose the features that are important to you because there's a lot of things that maybe are not that important to you that you're going to pay a high price for that you don't need or you will never use. The technologies are such that there are uh, vacation settings so that when you go on vacation, the humidity adjusts because you're not opening the door. Now, that may be very important to some people or not, but I can tell you you're paying for something like that. Um, when it comes to refrigerators, basically the most accessible ones would be a side-by-side -side refrigerator so that whether you're standing or whether you're seated, you're going to be able to reach both the freezer and the refrigerator portion. The other thing about that is the doors are only half as wide. So like if they're swinging into the room, you're taking up a lot less space. So if there's people working behind you, it really increases the, the workspace there quite a bit. There are also refrigerator and freezer drawers that go under the counter. They're like deep drawers. And some people will do that in lieu of a full refrigerator or an accessory so that maybe you've got a whole refrigerator and then you've got an under-counter freezer. It depends. And a lot of it has to do with the distribution of how you store food. You might not need a big freezer. You might just want this little freezer and then do more things in the refrigerator. So again, it's gauging how you live, how much room you have, and your lifestyle, and how you're going to use these things. As far as ranges go, slide-in ranges or drop-in ranges would be preferable to a freestanding range. Now, a freestanding range is one that sits on the floor that has an upstand like this on the back. The downside of that is the controls are always on the back, so you always have to reach over hot burners, reach over pots that are boiling, whatever, 
to get at the controls. So you've got the steam, you've got the burning, you've got that type of uh, problem, you know, that you can have reaching over. A slide-in or a drop-in range basically will have the controls at the front. So everything is right up front there. The controls are easy to operate. You're not reaching over anything. The other thing that's nice is without having the, back, the, the, the upstand on the back, you can do a really nice wall treatment with tile or something like that. You can put a spice rack there that's going to make using the stove so much more uh, uh, handy. And, and again, you're still going to buy a stove, but it's a matter of the choice of stove. Uh, the popular technology now is induction cooking. And again, it's actually an electric method of cooking. I know a lot of people on this island prefer gas if you can get gas. Now, if you're looking at gas, the best idea is to get one that has like continuous grates, continuous trivets on the top where you can slide things, rather than the ones that are individual, that have five, six pieces that you have to take apart and clean. But the induction method of cooking actually transfers from a magnetic element, a magnetic coil, transfers the heat from the coil to the pot, to the food. The cooktop does not get hot. So. There will always be a little bit of residual heat on the cooktop just because the food is hot and it's transferring to there, but it, it will never have a danger of actually burning you because it's not that hot. The other thing about induction cooking is you can go from just melting chocolate to a full rolling boil at the touch of a button. The control of it is so quick and so, uh, so large in its range that you're using so little energy. And so, again, you're thinking, well, electricity maybe costs more, but again, you're really drawing less. It's a very well-developed technology. The other thing about it, it's a completely smooth top. So if you couldn't lift that pot and you wanted to slide it over here, no problem. You know, you could slide it right off of there and right onto your countertop if you wanted to. So something to look into, something to think about. When you're looking at a wall oven, if you want to go a separate wall oven, which would always be at a more convenient height than one in a range, there are wall ovens that have a side opening door. There's a very few brands that have those, but that is one way that you can open the door and get right in front of it. If you don't have that and you have a drop-down oven door, if you can arrange to have some sort of a pull-out shelf right next to it, so when you pull out your oven rack, you can slide it right over onto this, this, this landing space, so to speak. It could be even in the form of like a cutting board. That type of thing would support something like that. Microwaves, again, there's microwaves now that go under a countertop. Uh, probably one of the unsafest treatments that you'll see in a home that may eventually be eliminated is having a microwave oven over a range, over a range of any type. The, the anomaly being that just having it, even if you have it level with your cabinets on the wall, it's at an unsafe height for most people to get things in and out of there. Um, ideally, the floor of a microwave should be somewhere between the elbow and the shoulder of the user. Okay, so if you picture it at about this level on the bottom, what you're able to do is pull it out without tipping it and scalding yourself. You can pull things out, put it down, and stir it and put it back in. Um, we often will drop down a shelf with a microwave shelf on it, on the wall, down even further. So that, I mean, we get a lot of people that are really short. So, you know, it should be where the people that are going to use it um, are going to, going to be having a safe height. Now, on cabinets, I think we've already mentioned about the, the base on casters that you can move out and use as an extra prep area around. Um, we talked about the doors and the handles. Now, I'll tell you, I've got an open plate rack in my house. I never thought I'd want one, but the plate racks, like in the old days when they, they separate the plates like this, it's the most wonderful thing. You can, you'll never have to lift a whole pile of heavy plates again. And, you know, you're using them. You're kind of using them in rotation so that you can see them there. They're, they're, they're nice to look at, and you can put them in such a space where they're all really accessible. Pull off if you need to or one or whatever. They come out of the dishwasher. They go right back in there. And, uh, honestly, it's, it's so much easier than trying to lift a whole stack out of the, out of the, the cabinet. Um, if you do a toe kick on your cabinet, on your base cabinet, the typical toe kicks are going to be four to four and a half inches high, but you can do a deeper toe kick. You can do six inches, you can do eight inches. So 
a person in a walker that has wheels, a person in a wheelchair, they can get a lot closer to the action there. They can roll up closer to that base cabinet and use it as a prep area as well. Not hard to do. It also looks really, really nice. It kind of gives it that raised pedestal kind of effect. And again, it's, it's later on you'd be, be pretty glad that you did that. Um, I know a lot of people really love walk-in pantries, but uh, they're not the best, okay? I mean, unless you are able to, to go all the way through one and pull things off the wall, that's great, but you're not going to get a turning radius in there. You'll get stuck in there later on. Are we at about an hour now? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, probably the best thing you can do in a kitchen when you're planning for the future has to do with um, accessories and accessibility. Pretty much the lower part of this board here shows a good example of all kinds of ways to bring things to you. Rather than you getting on your hands and knees and sticking your head in there and wondering where that pot was, which I think we've all done and probably still do, there are things that pull the entire corner out to you. Swing outs like half lazy Susans that pull right out to you and you just reach what's in back there. It's terrific. These roll out shelves, they're actually much improved now than they used to be. This one here shows that the guides are on the side. Now they have full extension guides that are mounted on the bottom, which gives you greater capacity on every shelf. They're full extension. You can pull it all the way out, lift out whatever's in the back. You don't have to pull out the stuff that's in front of it. And they're, they're a dream to use because you're, you're stopping all those actions you used to do before and getting to all your goodies. Uh, any type of uh, cu cutting, chopping, things like that. Uh, just as a side here, washer dryers. This is a good position for a washer dryer on a pedestal so that you can get to the front loaders that way. This piece here shows a section of a kitchen cabinet that actually rolls out. The countertop goes all the way across. This guy here just pulls right out. So you still have storage in it, but if you needed to have a place to work and sit there, there's your place right there. That, again, uh, you're needing a section at least 36 inches wide for this to be really useful in the future. Okay, storage, we've gone through some of that. Uh, revolving storage, probably we put a Lazy Susan in every kitchen <laughs> if we can because things again are coming to you. One thing you can do is put shelves above a backsplash. That's kind of a nice touch. Designate an area where you know, you can take a six inch space and have it coming out like that and you can have your mugs and things like that that you reach every day right there. Buy a pretty set of mugs, put them out there, use them for decoration. They'll be great and, and you'll get a lot of use out of them if they're right there and you're looking at them all the time. Um, lighting. One of the best things you can do is do under wall cabinet lighting so that that is called task lighting. You've got your ambient lighting on the ceiling as you're moving, moving around in the room. Task lighting is illuminating the countertop. So if you're working here, the light is here, not hitting you at the back of the head and casting a shadow on you. Um, if you are having under wall cabinet, whoo, wow, under wall cabinet lighting, um, it's a tendency of some electricians to like to put it back against the wall. But if you do that, you're only going to get half of the cone of light because it's, it's coming from back here going out like this. What you want to do is bring the underwall cabinet light toward the front of the cabinet just behind the door like that. Then you've got a cone of light coming down on your entire countertop front to back and you're getting the most out of that light. Um, LED lights are probably the, the, the coolest lights now. They burn the longest. They don't get your countertop hot. Some of the old lights that were out for a long time, they were so hot. I mean, you could really burn yourself. But they're getting better now. The LEDs are the ones that burn cool and give you a great, a, a great amount of light. Flooring, again, uh, there's a lot of different floorings that people use. Cork is one flooring that uh, people have overlooked for a long time, but now you can get cork in squares that are pre-finished in color, like tile. You can get unfinished cork that you seal and uh, color and finish just like hardwood floors. Uh, the thing about cork is it's very soft on your feet and very warm, and for a, a, a place that is barefoot a lot of the time, that's a pretty good feeling. Um, I know when I lived on Oahu, we did an awful lot of the really soft cushion vinyl floors 
it doesn't seem to be so popular anymore, but that really is one of the most durable, easy to clean, soft, easy on the back flooring materials that you can put down. There's, there's different levels of that too, as far as very thin that it's not going to hold the, la the length of time all the way to very cushy that has really good guarantees. So later on, if you are having to use an appliance, a wheelchair or whatever, it's not going to erode that floor. Tile is very, very popular, but it's hard. You know, working on tile is hard, so you end up putting cushions in front of your sink, which become a trip hazard. So, you know, again, it's uh, what's good, what's not. I don't know, you know, like people have even put wood in, you know, wood in their kitchens, and that's worked out okay as long as you don't leave puddles of water on the floor. Laminate flooring is very good. And, and again, taking care of it, laminate's a little bit warmer on your feet. Kind of the extension of all the rooms here that we're talking about is you can get things like remote control window coverings. So again, instead of reaching across a bathtub or whatever, if you have a large window over a bathtub, you can get a, a Roman shade that remotely you can do up and down instead of trying to climb in the bathtub and doing all of that. So anyway, that's all I got for you today. So that's a few of the ideas that I pulled from my resources. I hope, you know, you guys think about it, no matter what age or whatever, but, but really, I mean, it doesn't matter any time you can be injured, and uh, I just really hope everybody is safe, and planning ahead is the way to go. You know, I'm just getting ready for, for down the road. So thank you all for coming. He's going to shut me off.